Oh. Hi. Welcome back. I got the blues. You know why? Because it is time for another girlfriend episode. And this one doesn't even have them riding around on a bed together. This is Starsky's first girlfriend episode, and it's really more of a baby step to get to the real girlfriend episodes, because in this one, the girl in question is an ex-girlfriend, and she's dead from the second the episode starts. Still, with two exceptions, I am not here for girlfriend episodes, so let's just get this over with as painlessly as possible. Here is Lady Blue. <gasps> Michael, man! How could you? How could you betray me like this? Ugh. Anyway, we start out at Huggies where Hutch is chewing out somebody on the phone. Hutch is usually a pretty calm guy, but when he loses his temper, it's unpleasant. His car is broken down, surprising no one because it's a horrible piece of crap. But I love it. My name is Hutchinson. H-U-T... What? Well, look, fella, it didn't bother you when I signed the bottom of the check. Now, all I want to do is to get my car fixed. You understand? So let's take a year from the top. My membership number is 694-272-4-A. Yes, I'll hold. I've been holding for 20 minutes. I'm getting good at it. Hutch, I know you're angry, but it's probably not the guy on the phone's fault. Just speaking as someone in customer service, we don't appreciate being yelled at for things that we have no control over. Starsky picks him up and is not so subtly amused by the whole situation. Hutch then turns his anger toward numbers and code names for some reason, and dude, just calm down. Starsky, what? they feed us numbers all day long. They try to make us into one of them. Hmm. You see, zebra three, ten, four, forty, buffalo, and a gaggle of geese. A partridge and a pear tree. Sounds like Christmas. That's not funny. I know it's not funny, but it's not the end of the world either. I mean, look at it this way. They could have made us a uh, Wymarina 4. Zebra 3. You see, isn't that beautiful? Sadly, for the guys and for me, Starsky's mellow mood is about to be dashed as they respond to a dead body that turns out to be... Hey, you okay? It's Helen. Starsky, it's Helen. Frack is Helen. When Helen was first assigned, she rode with us for about a week. After that, she and Starsky were pretty close for a while. I'm supposed to see her own lieutenant later. But according to this, she quit the force about three months ago. Was that before or after you two broke up? After about a couple of months. Thank you, Detective Exposition and Captain Backstory. What happened to her? How'd she end up a go-go dancer in a joint like the Mellow Yellow? Mellow Yellow? I love that song! Dobie naturally tries to take Starsky off the case because, you know, personal ties and all that makes sense, but I'm not that lucky and I'm just gonna have to deal with Starsky moping over some woman I've never even seen for the next 40 minutes. Screw you, Michael Mann! They head down to the Mellow Yellow to talk to Helen's friend Cindy. Ah, <laughs> that fat guy belly slammed him. Do you guys know Helen? Yeah. Long time ago. I used to bang her. Cindy lets them know that Helen was dating the owner of the Mellow Yellow, who I assume is Donovan. At least I've seen a picture of her now. I can't complain about that anymore. You're Dave. Dave Starsky, aren't you? She told you about me. She never said you were a cop. She only said that maybe once she made a mistake. Ugh. Okay, I'm biased and I know that, but this is the problem with girlfriend episodes. They pop up and we're just supposed to accept the fact that they're the insta-loves of their lives. And it just happens too often for it to be believable at all. And just screw you, Michael Mann! They go see a snitch named Polly. Well, what can I do for you two guys? I'm busy! Polly, we're looking for a psycho. <laughs> Looks like you found one. Polly leads them to a man named James March Wrightwood. You know, I'm beginning to think that psych wards are not nearly as fun as the A-team made them out to be. They go to see Mr. Wrightwood, and he's got foil covering him. Okay? After that bit of strangest, it turns out that Helen never quit the force and was in fact undercover the entire time. You mean I'm not an amazing enough lover to make a woman quit her job and screw up her entire life? <sighs> That's preposterous! Helen was trying to bust up a burglary ring at the Mellow Yellow when her cover was supposedly blown. If they had done that to my girl, I'd think I'd take that Mellow Yellow joint apart piece by piece. <laughs> Please, Huggy, you don't scare anybody. The guys are now working under the assumption that the burglars killed Helen once they found out her cover, 
and wrapped her up in television antenna wire to make it look like a psycho did it. Because that seems like the most logical way to cover up your crime. There's a pretty funny bit here where they terrorize this car salesman into leading them to a thief named Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue! Uh, we want to talk with him. I told you I... Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! All right. All right, I'll call him. That's quality teamwork right there. The names are uh, Solenko, Ritlin, and Tui, a punk named Tui. Now, here's the sickie. Solenko owns the Mellow Yellow, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, look, don't get the wrong idea. You see, the reason I'm helping you find these guys is uh, well, they're not thieves. They're hoodlums. Well, a professional thief like myself, he gets out, he works for a living, you know, it's hard work. Uh, you are awfully snobby for a thief, you know that? Back at the Mellow Yellow, Cindy overhears the thieves talking about their next job. So she goes to call Hutch right outside the room where the bad guys are still discussing their plans. Oh my god! To no surprise, she gets caught. They kindly leave her alive, but they seem to have broke her brain pretty thoroughly. Now I woke up in the middle of the night last night thinking about Helen. The way we used to argue. The little fights we used to have. Starsky, I don't care about any of this. We used to talk about having kids. Getting married. So, how long were you two together? I mean, WTF! How long ago was this deep, meaningful relationship? Marriage and kids? Just stop, okay? I'm not buying it. Stop trying, because it's not working on me. They narrow down a general area where Solenko and his gang might hit next, and lucky for them, they're right on the money. Starsky, that gun's a little large, isn't it? So they catch Selenko and all the other thieves in problem solved, right? Nope. You're under the arrest for a little trespass, carrying concealed weapon, half a dozen other things I could think of. And the murder of policewoman Helen Davidson. You got the right to remain silent. Helen, and... what are you talking about? I never touched her. Don't jive me. Jive. Why don't people say that anymore? It turns out Helen did not blow her cover, and Selenko is not the one that killed her. Well, that was a nice, fun, pointless trip into Nowhereville. Thank you, Michael Mann. Back at the station, Starsky sits in Helen's car and starts fiddling with everything. Are you sure there's no further evidence in the car that Starsky is now contaminating? Hutch presses all the buttons on the radio, but it's the same station. Huh. Uh-oh, they've got another dead woman on their hands. All the buttons on the dead girl's car radio are set at 97.4. So were all the buttons on Helen's car down in the garage. See, there was technically still evidence in the car, Starsky. Way to go, God. They go back to see Foil Man, and Hutch ever so stealthily sneaks in. And Foil Man, a.k.a. Commander Jim Wrightwood, turns out to have been the killer all along. And he's stalking more dancers as we speak. The guys talk to Wrightwood's doctor and try to figure the guy out. Well, when were the tapes made? Uh, three months ago. Three months ago, and you let him back on the streets? James March Wrightwood left this institution a very healthy, sane individual. You know, I have watched too many true crime shows where the killer turned out to be a mentally ill individual who doctors released from the hospitals not to be pissed off at this guy. These test scores. Test scores? Man, we're talking about lives! Lives, man! Dead, mutilated girls, their lives, his life, he's a victim too. He's got electricity and chemistry running around in his head. He's all screwed up. You talking about test scores? You talking about because he passed a test? You tell him, Starsky. They track Commander Jim down where he's still got the woman alive. Hutch grabs the girl and Starsky tries to talk Jim down. Jim? Look. I'm pretty sexy, right? But Jim's not here for Starsky's rockin' bod and starts climbing the tower. Whoa, heights! Too high! Not following you up there, nope! And Jim falls to his death. I love how Starsky is desperately trying to save him, and Hutch is just kind of looking on... disinterested. Our tag is very sweet. Hutch makes Starsky his favorite dinner over candlelight and a sunset. Aw, that's the happy Starsky I know and love. All's well that ends well. Except for Helen.
and Cindy. And Jim. And that was Lady Blue. Maybe I was a little too hard on it. I mean, Michael Mann can write an engaging story. The red herring stuff was nothing particularly special to me, and I hate it when the show asks me to accept the relationship of the week as the truest love they've ever known. But... I do like Commander Jim's story, and I think that doctors, again, releasing patients before they're ready is still something that's relevant today, at least from what I've seen. I like that both Starsky and the show treat Jim as a victim and kind of villainize the doctor because, I mean, it's Starsky's ex-girlfriend who's been killed and even he's not so blinded by anger and grief to see what's really going on here. I thought that was a good stance for the show to take. So objectively, I think it's a fine episode. In my biased opinion, however, it doesn't make me rage but it's not something I really rewatch. This has been Fandom on Demand, bringing you fandom when you demand it.